In this interview, I'm joined by Arthur Verschluss, professor and department chair of religious studies in the College of Arts and Letters at Michigan State University, and author of over 25 books on subjects ranging from Western esotericism, magic, Christian theosophy, ancient mystery schools, and more. In this episode, we discuss Arthur's latest book, Conversations in Apocalyptic Times and trace a thread of esoteric Christianity that stretches back to the mystery schools of ancient Greece. We discover fascinating figures such as shoemaker and mystic Jakob Böhm, priest, alchemist and astrologer John Portage, and learn about the negative theology of Christian Neoplatonist Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite, contrasting it with Buddhist notions of emptiness and the neti neti method advocated by Shankara. Arthur also explains the differences between historical and ahistorical lineages and discusses the recurring friction between the religious mystic and the religious institution. So without further ado, Professor Arthur Verschluss. Professor Arthur Verschluss, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Many people will be very familiar with your uh, enormous output in terms of writing. And I was looking back and it's something like over 30 books now you've published in popular press in addition to uh, many articles. Is, is that correct? I do uh, both uh, academic scholarly publishing and then uh, uh, more general uh, commercial publishing and then occasionally some some fiction. So I haven't kept track of the actual numbers. Yeah, it's a lot. And uh, I know that you have been for many years a practitioner of Vajrayana Buddhism, although I first uh, came upon your work in the context of Western esotericism, particularly uh, the mystery schools of ancient Greece. That was in this, the secret history of Western sexual mysticism. And of course, uh, many of your earlier works, I, I could hold up a lot actually, but the philosophy of magic, Egyptian mysteries and so on. And I'd like to actually uh, draw on some of those themes, but mainly through the lens of your latest book, Conversations in Apocalyptic Times, a conversation between yourself and Robert Fass, a retired clinical psychologist, and we'll, we'll talk of, and a Western theosophist. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But I'm curious, before we dive into all that, could you say something about your, your background, your upbringing? How was it that you became interested in these themes? Well, my background is, is actually... Um... Uh, Dutch Calvinist, and I'm from a, from a farm family, and still, you know, still do work on the farm. I was brush hogging the other day, so, so, uh, family, uh, my family is actually uh, uh, largely Calvinist, and uh, you know, I grew up with uh, a lot of books, and so I just from an early age, just started to explore things that I saw as mysteries, you know, or as, as something that was, um, had a, uh, a kind of absence or lacuna in terms of what's, what's available on it. And that's the, that's the sort of thing I gravitate to what is, what's not as well known, what is, uh, suppressed or obscured. And so, uh, one thing leads to another and eventually, uh, you know, for example, in terms of Christianity, you realize that there are some kinds of Christianity that are hidden and uh, historically suppressed. And so then I follow up on that and investigate. In your latest book, Conversations in Apocalyptic Times, uh, you, you talk quite a lot about that idea of the mystery tradition aspect. Christianity as a mystery tradition, that's something I'd like to ask uh, ask you about in more detail. I'm curious, uh, you know, and you can go into as much or as little depth as you like on it. Was there a timeline of your interest uh, as you just started to discover these, the beginnings of these breadcrumb trails that you would later pursue in your writing and research? Well, the first uh, set of predecessors to the book that came out in 2021 uh, conversations in apocalyptic times, which is a, a conversation between me and uh, Robert Foss. Rob uh, Bob is a longtime practitioner and alchemist, 
and al practice as a form of alchemical uh, theosophy, Christian theosophy. And, uh, but my interest in that is, is quite, um, uh, quite predates that and started back in the nineties when I started to explore, uh, first discovering that there was a Christian mystical tradition that goes back to the early Christian period, then discovering that, uh, there was an entire movement, you could say, mystical movement that began around 1600 and included uh, uh, not only Germany, where Jakob Böhme, the, the mystical shoemaker, was born and uh, lived uh, in a Lutheran, he was, he was in a Lutheran environment, but also in France and then in England. And so you had a circle in England uh, around a man named John Portage, who's just an extraordinary figure. John Portage uh, uh, had, a, had a circle of people. He uh, practiced, he had a contemplative practice in which he would uh, uh, go into reclusion and sometimes was in a, in a contemplative state for up to uh, one of his colleagues uh, said in writing, uh, up to two weeks uh, at a time. So this this movement existed, and the library that you see around me, it actually has some of the manuscripts. And so uh, I went there and investigated those and uh, ultimately wrote my first book in this area, which is Wisdom's Children. And that was followed by uh, Wisdom's book, uh, also, Theosophia. Uh, I published a book, a uh, more popular book called Theosophia. And as a result of that, I started to get, I gave some talks. I was invited for some talks uh, and went to Minnesota. And at one of those talks, uh, this fellow came up to me and introduced himself and uh, said, we really, we really need to uh, talk about some of these things. And that was Bob Foss. And so uh, we met, um, you know, many years ago. So I've known him for a very long time. And one of the questions that I, I had, and I actually wrote people in Germany uh, and elsewhere uh, inquiring, are there, are there practitioners of uh, Christian theosophy? Hmm. Uh, theosophers, are there actually, is there any kind of lineage? And actually, uh, the answer in general is no. Um, in other words, and I mentioned this in a couple of places, I have a couple of books, um, one called Restoring Paradise, where I mentioned something called ahistorical continuity. Ahistorical continuity means that you, in historical continuity is the traditional idea of lineage. In uh, Buddhism, for example, a teacher uh, teaches a student who becomes a teacher, who teaches a student, and you can trace that lineage back in many cases. In, in the West, for various reasons, it largely seems to be a historical continuity where you, have, you do have teacher-student relations, you know, kind of relationships. And actually, Burma has, a di has dialogues, for example, that refer to that master and student. Um, but generally you don't. And so that's kind of a historical puzzle. Um, but you do have these reconstituted or remanifested kinds of groups or individuals. So you have somebody in Minnesota, for example, who uh, uh, over a long period of time becomes really deeply familiar and kind of reconstitutes the theosophic tradition. And that really in interests me. And so that's the genesis of the book, Conversations in Apocalyptic Times, which is really a venue for him to make available to a general reader an idea of theosophy in, a, in the context of contemporary psychology and that's you know that's really unusual and so that book was a great deal of work but it manifests something which is actually quite rare
And so I thought it was it was really valuable to bring that out. Certainly. And it's the format of the book is a dialogue uh, between yourself and uh, Robert Foss. Very interesting indeed. Well, let's pivot towards some of the themes of that book. You write the word mystery in English harks back to these mysterious traditions of great antiquity and antiquity and then late antiquity called the mysteries. And as to the mystery traditions, no one is fully certain what went on there because initiates were sworn to secrecy and kept it. But there are some hints or indications. I think I can safely say I've read all of the literature available on the mysteries and written a great deal of it, I'll interject. But back to the what's written. The mysteries were initiatory traditions in which people would go into a night setting and in a group experience a movement through the underworld, through darkness, into illumination. And it was said that the sun shone at midnight and that the light shone in the darkness. You continue. So the mysteries themselves, whether it's the Eleusinian mysteries, whether it's the Samothracian mysteries or in other locations, because there were a number of mystery locations, all did in fact involve a movement through the underworld or a symbolic underworld journey. And then illumination. That's actually the essence of what the mysteries were when we go back to the origin of the word mysteries. And that's one of the things that seems to be missing in our modern world. And then you go on to write uh, that Christianity itself can be understood as a mystery tradition. You describe it as mystery revelation. You write, that's for most people, I think, a very unfamiliar way of understanding that tradition. For most people, what they're exposed to in terms of Christianity may be a kind of fundamentalist form, which tends to be very literalistic. They might have been exposed to anti-materialist, scientific or atheistic perspectives that are also very literalistic. I think this is such a fascinating area. You mentioned uh, your first book uh, that dealt with these themes. Can you talk a little bit about mystery and how Christianity in specific can be seen as a mystery tradition? Well, when you look at the Christian theosophic uh, tradition or current, which really has its inception with Jakob Burma. Uh, Burma reveal he he his first book is Aurora or Dawn, and he publishes, uh, and he was banned from publishing that uh, from publishing for years by his Lutheran pastor, his local pastor, uh, after this was revealed, after this book was was made available, it was circulated, right? It was circulated in a small group and and the pastor got wind of it and then banned him for years from, from writing. Well, that in a nutshell is the difference between uh, different forms of Christianity. And you see that in Islam as well. Uh, you have Sufis who, who uh, end up being uh, killed or persecuted. And, and that's happening today, actually, uh, as well. This conflict between, on the one hand, mystical uh, uh, forms of Islam and then more fundamentalist ones. It's, it's not a unfamiliar monotheistic dynamic. And in the case of Christian theosophy, what you have is really a mystery tradition, Christianity as uh, a revelatory mystery and as illumination. And so that's true of Burma, Burma writes about the, he writes about the Christian uh, mysteries of the Eucharist and of uh, baptism as, as uh, being uh, mystery traditions in the sense of having a transcendent dimension, uh, having dimensions that are not purely physical. They're, and that uh, that is true also of the English theosophers. So, for example, John Portage. Portage's works are really extraordinary and uh, actually only now being uh, published again in English. The manuscripts were lost or destroyed in English for these books, but fortunately they had been published in German. And so it's a matter of retranslating them from German of that time back into English, and that's being done. It's a monumental project. The first of those has been made available. It's a book called Sophia. And after Sophia, there are 
a whole series of books which reveal a completely different kind of Christianity, one that's actually much closer to uh, both some of the schools in uh, late an- in late antiquity in the early Christian period, but also to the ancient mystery schools because there's a current within Christianity. There, basically, you know, broadly, you can say there's the current of figures like Tertullian or Irenaeus, the church fathers who hated paganism, hated, hated the mysteries. They, they, they really, hate is not too mild a term. <laughs> it's not too strong a term. It's perhaps even mild, uh, ridiculed, and detested, um, the ancient mystery tradition. But you have another view, which is uh, that there's a continuity between these ancient uh, uh, traditions, mystery traditions of illumination, and the illuminatory tradition of Christ, and Christ as a revealer, Christ as a a figure, a bringer of light. Uh, That you see in the wake of Burma, uh, especially in the figure Schelling, the philosopher Schelling, um, usually depicted in, in a Uh, not in the way that I'm describing him now, uh, because there are certain things to get edited out about Schelling. If you go look up uh, Schelling on, you know, online, and I was doing it the other day just for um, uh, my own uh, uh, interests. And, you know, none of these things are mentioned in the, you know, but, but Schelling was someone who had read about and written about the mysteries of Samothrace. He understood the mystery, ancient mystery tradition to a very high degree, I think. And he also understood Burma. <clears throat> and so you have, you do have people who are, <clears throat> are uh, exemplifying this uh, current that I'm talking about, and I think Schelling is clearly one of them, but at the same time, it is very obscure. It's esoteric for a reason, and the word esoteric uh, really literally means restricted to a few, and that's and that uh, goes back to the Pythagorean uh, uh, meaning of the term esoteric. That's the origin in in uh, uh, when you trace it back, and that's the case for this mystery tradition within Christianity. So you have uh, you have this existing, and yet at the same time, it's very little known, and that's the sort of thing that interests me. It's not my only interest, but it's certainly it's certainly uh, worthy of investigating. Indeed, if we were to cover all of the avenues of that your work is pursued, we'd have to have a very long podcast. So. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we're sort of zoning in on this particular one for now, but I'm curious, uh, well, several things really. You've written about Christian theosophy. You've written there's cl- in Conversations for Apocalyptic Times. There's classical literature, there's mystery literature, and there's mystical literature. There are alchemical writings, and then something that we're both particularly drawn to, this is you in conversation with Bob Fass, the tradition of Christian theosophy which draws together many of these different strands into a single strand, making it challenging. And I'm curious if you can, I suppose, characterize Christian theosophy, perhaps in contrast with, I suppose, the more institutional variety uh, that has predominated, although that, of course, has gone through its own evolutions and changes. For for example, you mentioned about uh, Jakob Böhm's uh, writing about rituals such as the Eucharist and seeing a, a transcendental or uh, having a transcendental view of those sorts of literature that presumably nuances or perhaps at times is at odds with the uh, mainline view. Um, could you take a ritual like the Eucharist, for example, or, or something similar and contrast the two views, the Jakob Bohm view and the, and the standard view, and perhaps also explain a little of this word theosophy. Listeners may be familiar with the Theosophical Society, which is a different uh, animal entirely. 
I'm, I'm wondering if you could, I suppose, put a bit more flesh on the bone of this, this term Christian theosophy. Sure. I think, I think fundamentally the difference between what we're talking about and what most people are familiar with is that uh, Christian theosophy is a contemplative tradition. And so it has to do with uh, the inner path and with uh, inner transformation. And so one of the, the alchemical dimension of it is, uh, as Bob describes it in the book, working through your shit working through your, your uh, dark side and um, moving into the light as an existential path. Uh, it's a path of personal transformation. And uh, so that's, that's tied to the contemplative uh, dimension uh, completely because those two things are part of one another. Uh, and that is something that when I was growing up, I, you know, I went to a, uh, I would say, um, uh, more or less middle of the road Calvinist uh, church, my family. And I mentioned this in the book, uh, that there was a, a minister one summer day uh, who had been, he was a youth minister and he had been given the chance to preach. And so he preached briefly, uh, alluding to his own mystical experience with uh, Revelation of Christ and Meister Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, the great German mystic who uh, is very enigmatic. Um, Meister Eckhart is uh, revealing a non-dualist form of mystical Christianity uh, in Christian language, using terms like Godhead, but in very in a very Zen-like way, and that's why he became connected to Zen within Japan. Uh, Zen practitioners read Meister Eckhart and said, "Oh, okay, yeah, this I can see this." Um, and so there's there's a continuity between Zen-influenced philosophy in late you know mid to late 20th century Zen, uh, Japan. In Meister Eckhart, uh, just to give you a brief, you know, a, you know, listeners a brief um, bit on that. And this minister mentioned Meister Eckhart, and he was he was thereupon, and his own mystical experience, and was thereupon banned from preaching. So, uh, and barely maintained his his youth uh, ministry position, and didn't preach again. So that was an indicator to me. Uh, that something's going on here. Uh, that was also a kind of thumbnail version of the, the kind of uh, difference, right? Because in a conventional or a confessional church, mysticism, spirituality are not necessarily terms that people are very comfortable with. And that's true across denominations. It's certainly not just the one that I mentioned, but also uh, in Catholicism, uh, now there, and in uh, even Orthodoxy, which has an extraordinary contemplative tradition, still, it's not something that you necessarily find discussed very much. Um, and at least in the Orthodox churches that I've been in and are, you know, am familiar with. So that's, you know, that's really the, the crux of the matter. Uh, on the one hand, you have mysticism and contemplative practice, and on the other hand, you have other forms of religion, um, other forms of uh, monotheism that really are either not that interested in it or are actually just straight up hostile to it. And that's really the dy dynamic we're talking about. And that's distinctly monotheistic, in my opinion. Um, so th those are a few remarks on that. Hmm. What do you think is the, the cause underlying this dynamic, this tension between the institutional religious structure, those, those more institutional forms of religion and the mystical? I think actually of, you know, when you said, you mentioned it's uh, distinctly monotheistic, I was thinking of 
immediately, of course, my mind went to other traditions, and I think of the sort of wandering yogis of the uh, of the Himalayas and their occasional conflict or at least friction between those sorts of, I suppose, Mahasiddha style mystical figures and the religious institutions of the great monasteries and so on. So I'm curious um, when you say it's distinctly monotheistic, if you mean that that's a place where it's uh, most vicious or most uh, consistently apparent or or if you see it appearing in other contexts, such as say a, a Buddhist context in, in Tibet, for example, old Tibet. But what fundamentally, what is the origin, do you think, of this this uh, almost kind of Cain and Abel enmity? Why do Ch Chertelian and these church fathers, origin and so on, hate the hate the pagan mystery school so much? What what is this uh, opposition, and where does it come from? Well, that's a good question, and I think it it comes down to ultimately. Um, it has to do with uh, dualism. It's it's a dualistic uh, us versus them uh, perspective, and that's not the only angle that one can take on the past. Uh, of course, there are institute there are conflicts between you know individuals, individual practitioners, you know maybe hermit and you know recluses or wandering yogis, as you say, and institutions. I mean, there's a history of that, of course, because, and then also, instant, you know, it's not that all institutions are, you know, uh, perfect. It's that in in Asia or in you know Buddhist monasteries or you know, it's that the kind of dynamic that we're talking about here is uh, really an endemic one, I think, uh, within the Christian. Uh, also Islamic and to some extent Jewish worlds. And so, the, and I actually think it to some extent goes back to the question of how one understands is deity external? Um, because if deity is, an, is external, then that is uh, kind of an implicit dualism between us and deity, however one conceives it. Whereas if if there's the to the degree that you see that there's an internal dimension or that there's not a division then that gets that starts to uh, disappear that dualism starts to disappear and that's really i think when you get down to it some of what we're talking about here and the christian theosophers themselves experience this so for example in uh, England, there was a theosophic group, which was, uh, you know, essentially attacked, um, even physically by people uh, for their uh, practices. Of course, they were a somewhat apocalyptic group. And so as a result, um, you know, there is a sort of self-fulfilling dimension to that. But this kind of tension that I mentioned, which was there with Burma and his his Lutheran pastor, and is there in the Church Fathers, runs, you know, really does run through the tradition. And the mystical side is one that really doesn't get much play. It's not discussed very often. And uh, uh, it is, there is, of course, scholarly literature on it, but in terms of the way Christianity is discussed especially today, uh, I have a book called Platonic Mysticism in which I write a bit about uh, the way the term mysticism has been changed over the last, uh, say, 100 years. And it's, it's lost all its specificity, and it has to some extent become... Um, a term of marginalization because we have so such a materialistic uh, and materialistically influenced worldview now. And so mysticism becomes synonymous with woolly mindedness. It becomes a term of denigration. And that's, that's actually an indicator of something being lost. So my job in part is to recover these things and shed light on them. 
And so I investigate and, and uh, explore. And, you know, for me, writing is a great adventure. So all of this is, is part of that adventure. So are, are you saying that the, the mystic, if we think in, in the Christian term, sometimes the mystic is, becomes one with God or um, un, unify, unity with God or uh, the, the great nada uh, of St. John of the Cross, something like that. This sort of tremendous intimacy with God, almost erotic at times. I uh, think of Teresa of Avila, for example, that, um, that that is somehow an affront to, uh, it's almost a threat to God, if God is external. I'm trying to get to the, the bottom of what's, why is it such, why does it, uh, the mystic uh, view or the mystic uh, you know, view, let's say, provoke such a visceral knee-jerk reaction from not only the institution in terms of its uh, hierarchical expression in terms of its structural expression, but also in terms of everyday adherence of that more institutional view? It's certainly uh, a good question. And it's, it's, a, it's the recurrent question when you're looking at mysticism because it keeps recurring historically. And uh, why? Right? Why? Um, it's uh, to, give, to give an example um, Eckhart, who's an extraordinary mystic, um, uh, one of the greatest exemplars in the history of Christian mysticism, was condemned as heretical. Uh, and another uh, exemplar of this tradition, uh, I wouldn't say mysticism is necessarily union. It's often described as union with God, but that's not really the tradition that I, I am um, uh, pointing to in these various books. Uh, when you go back and look at the origins of the Christian mystical tradition that I really am focusing on, uh, a central figure is Dionysus the Areopagite, who is, who, uh, we of of whose work we have a number of treatises. One of those treatises is called Mystical Theology. Mystical Theology is not about uh, union with God. It is rather def essentially defining transcendence as not this, not this, not, uh, if you're familiar with the Prajnaparamita Sutra, you know, no eyes, no ears, no taste, no touch, no smell, no seeing, no hearing, no, right? There's this long list of no's uh, in the Prajnaparamita Sutra. Well, guess what? Uh, Dionysus the Areopagite, it's a long series of negations. Not this, not like that, not that, not conceived, not. And so that is a different, that is sheer trans, what I would say, if I were going to describe it, I would say sheer transcendence. Uh, and of course, you can't describe it because that's the whole point. Um, but it is nonetheless alluded to in a negative way. That's why it's called negative theology. Burma does exactly the same thing. Eckhart did the same thing. It's this pointing toward transcendence. And in another example, though, from Eckhart's, you know, roughly Eckhart's time, Marguerite of Perret, who was a she was a, a mystic in this tradition. She wrote very much in the Dionysus the Areopagite tradition of, of not this, not that. Uh, she was burned to death as a heretic. That's why I mention her. It's a horrific fate. And you read her treatise. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful treatise of negative theology. Uh, so that um, fate it underscores the tension that we're talking about. It's more than a tension. But what we have here is something that is a fundamentally different way of understanding Christianity. And there are scholarly works and various works about this. And in my own way, I've, I've uh, pointed at a number of different uh, ways of seeing this tradition. One is Christian theosophy, but the other, which I allude to in the 2017 book, Platonic Mysticism, which is a Sunni book, is 
Platonic mysticism, the importance of the Platonic tradition in all of this, because it's not only uh, strictly Christian, Platonism through the figure of Dionysus, the Areopagite, and then later uh, uh, also the influence of, of um, uh, the kind of influx of um, the other Platonists who then fed into Christianity because Dionysus, the Areopagite, opened the way through these treatises that were brought into the tradition. Uh, you also then have the influence of the, the later Platonists um, and their uh, line. So there's a, I guess what I'm saying here is that there's a direct line between the mystery tradition, traditions, Platonism, through whom those traditions manifest, and then that directly into Christianity. So it's not simply a case of Christianity alone it's also pre-existing current that feeds into it, which feeds into it through Platonism, because Dionysus the Areopagite, well, he may or may not have been, because we don't really know who he actually was, his um, uh, Dionysus the Areopagite is the vehicle for Platonism to enter Christianity and and be carried. It's not the only one, but it's very influential. And so that current is, is part of the direct link between the ancient mystery traditions, Platonism, and then Christianity all the way through into the, the uh, contemporary period. We don't know who Dionysus the Areopagite was. He, he, was, uh, he may have been actually a, he's sometimes called pseudo-Dionysus because uh, there was a Dionysus in the New Testament, and so he wasn't him, so he must be a pseudo. And so, uh, and also that that casts a certain light on his work because if your if your first name is pseudo, <laughs> that really doesn't do so well for these treatises. Uh, so I use the term uh, Dionysus the Areopagite because that's the term that he actually used uh, you know, the name, and we don't know who he was. He could have been. Uh, and there's there's been occasional uh, scholarly uh, speculation that Dionysus was uh, actually uh, one of the Platonists sort of undercover, um, putting Platonism into Christianity so it would survive. Um, so there's sort of a skullduggery, you know, theory about about who he was. Um, who knows, really? Who knows? But he himself... Um, is the author of the of someone was the author of these treatises and they were carried into the tradition and became very influential and that's and their treatises both of negative theology which is not this not that but also a, an affirmative uh way and the affirmative way is the way of symbolism and of seeing the transcendent dimensions of symbols, and that would also include baptism and Eucharist. And so you have this, this idea of, of movement through uh, vision and through symbol toward transcendence. And then you have its complementary opposite, you could say, which is the sheer transcendence, uh, the negative way. So negative way and positive way are are complementary, uh, and that's extremely important in understanding the whole history of uh, Christian uh, mysticism. And here, primarily, I'm talking about European Christian, uh, Western European, not as much, not quite as much uh, Orthodox, uh, although Bob, in the book Conversations, uh, does discuss Orthodoxy, and he himself uh, he and his wife are actually Orthodox. And so they, they do bring uh, a hesychastic uh, understanding of Jakob Burma in the context of contemporary psychology. Hmm. In the case of the negative theology of Dionysus the Areopagite, you mentioned the Heart Sutra and the negations that are uh, there. 
this sort of way of expressing shunyata or you know emptiness and within buddhism of course as, as you know of course the uh that term itself is somewhat hotly debated uh, the madhyamaka lit literature for example versus the yogacara literature and i also think of shankara with his technique of neti neti not you know not this not this not this same sort of idea and that has been interpreted uh, many uh, different ways of course what's left at the end of it all is it brahman is it non-dual uh, union with with you know, the atman and so on what, what is it so what in the negative theology is proposed to be if you want the remainder when all else has been negated is there such a thing or is it in, in the way of the madhyamaka or certain aspects of the madhyamaka the absence of a remainder well that points toward a real you know which is philosophy or perennialism and you know are these are referring to the same thing you know is this is you know to what extent is and that of course moves toward the 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 argument you know that it's all the same and i don't make that argument um I'm not making that meant. I'm saying that there's this tradition within Christianity, which is historically important. And it is important for understanding what Christianity is and Platonism as well as part of that larger current. Uh, but in terms of, uh, once you start to go into comparison, there are some interesting things that that you can begin to see. Uh, I myself have been engaged in uh, Buddhism, Buddhist practice, Buddhist meditation practice for quite a long time. And one of the reasons for that is Buddhism is uh, a tradition that maintains a continuous set of lineages and teachers, right? teachers and students, the, the idea of line, initiatory lineage is very real. I've had uh, initially some experience in Rinzai Zen and uh, then moved over time uh, quite naturally to Tibetan Buddhism. And there are traditions within Tibetan Buddhism that are, that are really helpful. Uh, one of those is Mahamudra uh, meditation tradition. And in referring to those, I'm not making comparisons in the sense of saying um, that a Buddhist uh, understanding of uh, emptiness or shunyata is the same as what we're describing. What I'm saying, though, is that Christianity has a tradition which is, uh, you, you can make comparisons. Actually, it's quite surprising the number of things that that do that are comparable but it stands in its own right it's its own current and uh, i think it's important to point it out because it's so little uh recognized and i think it's important for us to be aware of uh that there, well, to be aware that there is in the uh, Christian tradition in particular, a mystical current that's actually quite important and has, has its own implications. And part of that is also the grail tradition, something that we talk about in, in the book Conversations. The grail tradition uh, is is really a way also of understanding the cultural and you could say political dimensions of, of what we're talking about, because it's not only uh, strictly personal, there are also cultural dimensions. And that's, that's an interesting uh, area to pursue as well. That's something I'm also very interested in. Yes. I'd like to ask you actually uh, quite a bit about that, the grail and the grail the grail cycle and also your comments in the book uh, cultural comments one last question on on the uh theosophical 
uh, lineage, Christian theosophical lineage. You, know, you mentioned perennialism there. You've mentioned figures like uh, Jakob Bohm, and who I, I think is another uh, figure who over time has become shrouded in all sorts of mystery and myth and legend in certain quarters. For instance, I know the Rosicrucians hold him in quite high regard and in certain aspects of that group um, uh, see him as, as uh, quite a significant uh, occult figure, actually. Um, you mentioned a historical lineage. How is it, do you think, that these bubblings up, Jakob Bohm, for instance, or Bob Fass, uh, who I suppose you could ask direct, who, who we could ask directly, how do these people come upon or rediscover, ahistorically out of time, this current? How do they get back in touch with it? Is it a, a discovery of certain texts and manuscripts? Is there a dormant or, or you know, secret uh, lineage, a sort of ear whispered lineage of sorts uh, that's, uh, that is, is there somehow? How are these currents revived and uh, reconstructed? in, in the, uh, throughout history? H how does that work? And um, are there any implications in terms of, I suppose, accuracy or fidelity to the principles and techniques of that current? That's a really interesting question because uh, what, what you see when you uh, look at the history is something like what you see when you look at the history of Platonism, which is uh, in Florence, you had uh, these, these uh, philosophers and uh, leaders who wanted to develop a, a culture that derived from Platonism and from the ancients and generate, essentially, it was to some extent a conscious effort to regenerate Platonism in Florence, uh, which generated the Renaissance. And where does the Renaissance come from? Uh, what, how is it that Florence did this? Well, some, some things came together, and when the circumstances come together, and then you have these extraordinary figures that manifest themselves like Marsilio Ficino or Pico della Mirandola. And you have, you have this confluence of, of wealthy people who are sponsoring this and an effort to create a virtuous society. Suddenly you have a transformation. Where does that come from? I don't, it's, it's a historical in the sense of continuity. It's a sudden kind of rebirth uh, and that's based in these Platonic texts, that's a Renaissance. Where does that, how does that happen? Hmm. It's, it's kind of mysterious, really. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, coming together of contingent, contingent uh, circumstances that produce it. And so, too, where did Eckhart come from? Where did Meister Eckhart come from? This, this astounding figure who doesn't give us any explanation of how he got to where he was. He doesn't say, I meditated for 12 years in a cave on, you know, using such, he doesn't. So where did Eckhart come from? I don't know. Where, you know, really, I mean, you kind of know, he discovered somewhere along the way, the texts of Dionysus the Areopagite and, uh, you know, and, and a few others. And, and so that's a really good question. Where did Boma come from? Boma was a shoemaker, right? And he pulls together these currents of alchemy, of Christian mysticism, of uh, elements of, of Kabbalah, different, different things, that different currents. And you have this extraordinary synthesis. Where does it come from? Well, it does come from those things. But how is it that it's Boma? The shoemaker, I mean, he's an ordinary guy. How is this even possible, right? It seems incredible when you look at it. It's extraordinary. So that's a good question. And the answer is not entirely clear. It's the mystery of circumstance, I think, and confluence. How did Bob Fass put it together? Have you asked him that? He has been working in a synthesis, you could say, I mean, he's a 
He's a practicing um, clinical psychologist who drew together different uh, psychological um, forms of, of working, especially uh, Jung and Asagioli, both of whom are uh, important. Uh, but he's not a Jungian at all. I wouldn't describe himself as that. Uh, but he drew together those currents with uh, the Christian theosophic tradition, which he's been working in and familiar with for decades. I mean, we begin the, by say, I'm sitting in the library of Robert Foss, and that's an important note important thing to to recognize because his library is not nothing it is it is a remarkable library with many theosophic texts uh that are quite rare and he's been steeped in that and combines that with the practice of clinical psychology and has done so for many years and so you have a unique synthesis and that's an example of, uh, he's an example of what I was talking about with regard to the Renaissance and the idea of a Renaissance happening spontaneously in particular places because of a confluence of different factors. And in the case of theosophy or Christian mysticism, texts are an important part of that. And the texts provide pointers and directions, but then people pick, pick up on it. The question is, does it remain an individual practitioner somewhere, or ha does it have larger implications, more broad implications for society as a whole? Indeed, and that's something that you discuss with Robert in the book, uh, Conversations for Ap Apocalyptic Times. And I'm also pleased to, uh, we were discussing prior that uh, you're open to doing perhaps a series of dialogues or at least a, a further conversation. And we'll go, I think, deeper into some of those themes, particularly the role of the grail uh, and, and other uh, mythic uh, strands in this regard. And also your work on immediatism. Uh, your book, American Gurus, which you were just discussing, is particularly uh, fascinating. And, you know, I really would like to ask you a bit about Adida. He and the network of figures associated with him, such as Rudy and Muktananda and so on, um, has, has always fascinated me or fascinated me for a very long time. You know, people don't know, I think, what an influence he had, especially in the first decade or so of his career. And that whole scene, that whole period of time, that stretch of, of, of time with all of those, those figures interacting uh, is, I think, just a tremendously fascinating area and, and one you've documented very thoroughly. And one, I think, that has downstream relevance uh, even in in the sorts of themes we're seeing today we could do that thank you very much uh, professor versh lewis well thank you i appreciate the conversation thank you for listening to another guru viking podcast for more interviews like these as well as articles videos and guided meditations visit www.guruviking.com